Pulp MX Network production. EDS Sports brings you a cheeky Brit and an American YouTube racing sensation weekly on the LVK More Than Moto podcast. Here's your hosts, Lewis Phillips and Kellen Brower. Yeah, welcome everybody back to Lewis versus Kellen More Than Moto, episode number eight, brought to you by EVS Sports. I am Kellen Brower from Racer X. He is Lewis Phillips from Vital MX, and we are going to recap some things from Daytona. We're going to talk about some things to highlight going into the MXGP season and many other things in between. Lewis, first of all, uh, how are you, sir? Another remote week for us, but this time you're not uh, in California, you are in Florida. Yeah, well, actually, I'm in Georgia, I think. Oh. I actually don't know where I am. My American geography still needs some work. Um, but yeah, remote, I miss you, Kellen. I've not even seen you at the races. Um, but hey, uh, absence makes for heart grow fonder, is the saying. <laughs> yeah, Distance. When you say it with a question mark, it doesn't sound as uh, flattering. But yes. I, I agree. Uh, when, when no, I just wasn't sure what weeks. the saying was. Is it absence? Is it distance? Is it? Yeah, I think it's absence or okay. distance. It could be either. I guess I don't know. Both of them. Um, but yes, it's okay. been a, it's been a little bit since we've actually seen each other in person, which is the first time this year. I feel like it's been that way. But we'll catch each other again soon. Um, how was Daytona for you? Uh, it sounds like the experience was magnificent. You got to go VIP experiencing and all that with Steve. Yes, thank you to Steve Mathis for hooking me up. Um, I wasn't so excited about Daytona purely because for as long as I can remember, I've heard Steve say on every podcast how terrible it is. Um, and I guess that proves that marketing does work because it had subconsciously had an effect on my perspective of Daytona. But with a nice hookup, a nice VIP suite, and all of that good stuff. It was a very pleasant experience. And you know, halfway through the event, I had to kind of take stock a little bit because I was like, huh, I'm at Daytona. Like, don't, you know, like sometimes you have to remind yourself, don't lose sight of how good things are. You can get wrapped up in the moment and like, you know, forget the little things. But for a very long time, Lewis would have killed a man to go to Daytona. Do you, uh, with Daytona specifically, do you not being an american fan get any like i don't know emotions of like oh this is this is such a pinnacle of motorsport this facility right here like if you went to le mans in europe or something like that i don't know like do you ever feel that way about it uh no you're i honestly don't know what happens there besides <laughs> supercross um okay i honestly i don't i was gonna say i don't get it but that's false because it does have some sort of um nostalgic feel for me because uh, Daytona 2005 was a great race. Some memories like that come flooding back to me, but it's all super cross orientated to be completely honest. Um, growing up when it was Daytona week, I was more annoyed than anything because I was just like, Oh, I just want to just get back to the real Supercross. Like mm. I can't wait for Daytona to be over so we can go back to regular Supercross. Um, yeah. I, I feel like that is, quite a striking opinion um, but that was just how i felt growing up i don't know if it has something to do with being foreign so as you said daytona maybe doesn't hold the same sentimental value for me yeah, uh, but yeah that was always my feelings ah, well interesting i, I feel like uh, daytona fans are probably not going to be thrilled with that take but i get it you know i i don't know that i would feel overwhelmed going to whatever manchester city's stadium is or something like that you know something well, neither would i well, I mean, not saying you, but, you know, I'm sure British people, I don't, I don't know what hollowed grounds are over there, but I feel like Daytona is a hollowed ground for motorsports. Well, no, like, yeah, the seeing the so. Daytona sign was cool and being okay. in All Daytona right. was cool. That's but what I'm it's trying to get like, out of you. All right. Okay. I don't know what you mean. Like, it doesn't, like, I wasn't, I didn't stand there and go, wow, in NASCAR in 1997, not... this happened here. <laughs> I'm just saying because it's such a big place for motorsports. It's not just the Daytona 500. It's the 24 hours of Daytona, the Daytona Supercross, the Daytona 200 for uh, street bike racing. Like, there's just so much that goes on there. So, uh, yeah, I only know about the Supercross. Okay. Um, right. In fact, maybe we should have debated my confusion at Bike Week, but that isn't on our dock okay. this week. Yeah. So, yeah. well, we're already 
too deep in the non-moto stuff, I feel like, at this point anyway. But uh, let's get into our topics here today. Before we do that, big shout out to EVS Sports. Uh, experience the pinnacle of knee protection and injury prevention with EVS Web Eclipse Knee Brace. For over 39 years, EVS has relentlessly honed their engineering expertise, consistently delivering award-winning knee braces. The legacy of excellence is embedded in every facet of the new Web Eclipse which represents the culmination of their tireless dedication to innovation and rider safety. Use code LVK30 to save 30% off today. And I actually have a pair of those knee braces and they are sweet. I really, uh, really like those. Can't wait to really get into and ride them. Uh, ride with them, I should say. Uh, also, a big thanks to Nomura for presenting this show to you guys, the leading power of engine components and motor for motocross, ATV, UTV, and personal watercraft. For over two decades, Nomura has been the preferred choice for premium and dependable engine components for more than 20 years. Whether you're restoring your vintage bike, rebuilding your four-wheeler, or upgrading your new 450 race motor, Nomura has you covered. Our extensive line of cast and forged pistons, connecting rods, gasket kits, engine valves, and soon cylinder kits that enhance your engine's performance. Keep an eye out for our new and innovative products in 2024 and beyond. Stay up to date by following us on Instagram at Nomura underscore technologies. And lastly, a shout out to Race Tech. We'll uh, have two Race Tech fan questions this week, so we're kind of excited to give them a little bit extra shout out. But for 40 years, Race Tech has been supplying the motorcycle industry with high quality suspension components made right here in the USA. For modern and vintage, Race Tech is your go to source for suspension performance. So thanks, guys, again for supporting the show. And they bring you episode eight of LVK More Than Moto. All right, topic number one, Lewis. And uh, the second I said this one to you today, you were like, yeah, let's talk about that. So Daytona happens. Jet Lawrence gets the win in kind of a dominating fashion in a sense that he went through Eli Tomac and Chase Sexton and then pulled away um, and now has a pretty comfortable points lead. It's not massive, but it's a little bit more comfortable than it was going into Daytona. And more guys that we expected to be in the fight, Jason Anderson, Aaron Plessinger, Etc. had bad nights at Daytona. So the points are way more kind of wide open, I feel like, after Daytona than it was coming in. And so the question is, Lewis, is this the round now where we look back and we go, oh, that that's where it all changed. Like, that's where the series really hit its turning point. Yes, 100%. Uh, on my Vital MX post-race show, I started by saying two statements. One, and then, they were, and then there were four, because we have definitely gone from seven realistic title contenders to four. I do not believe that anyone can dispute that. And second of all was um, the series starts at Daytona, except did it just end at Daytona? Um, which is honestly kind of my stance because Jet has this figured out, and I've said this in multiple places as well, but in my eyes, this is two in a row for Jet. Yes, he didn't win Arlington, but the way that he rode, how good he was, subconsciously for me, that is that is a win. I know it isn't, and that may be hard for people to grasp, but you get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I feel like, yeah, I feel like Jet has this thing in his mitts at the moment, and I don't know how it's going to be possible to stop him. Now, momentum could swing this weekend. Uh, it's meant to be really wet in Alabama. Um, and although rain is meant to stop around 8 a.m. on Saturday morning, maybe it will be so wet that it's just a mudder. I don't believe so. We've seen many times that dirt works can basically save the track as long as it doesn't rain during the event. But yeah. if it's a mudder, maybe that swings the momentum again, and this is all irrelevant. But right now, I believe that this is the Jet show. Yes. Yeah, I think the thing that skews it for Jet, uh, when I look at him at this point in time, is two things. First of all, the eye test shows that he's only ever going forward if he's on two wheels. Like, At what point have we actually seen him in a main event going the opposite direction? It hasn't happened yet, uh, except those two mud races. But even those... like he would pick it up and make passes and then crash again. So the crashes are his kryptonite or what they have been so far. And the other thing that stands out to me, which I'm sure you feel the same way about this is the laps lead chart on the season is massively skewed. Like jet is taking up like 75 to 80% of the total laps led on the season. And then Webb has two wins, but he's only led five laps. I think Eli's only led like not even that many as well. So it, it just, it's all trending jet as we keep saying week in and week out, and it's more about, is he going to make these mistakes? But the way that he just won Daytona kind of, to me suggests, no, he's like you said, got it figured out. 
Yeah, and if I am one of the other contenders, what is concerning to me is the window has been open thus far. Um, Jet has made some mistakes, and in theory, if any other contender had been able to establish any sort of consistency, Jet wouldn't be leading the points right now. But unfortunately for us as fans, no one really capitalized on Jet's mistakes. And so Jet has gone through the rookie mistakes, seemingly learnt from them, and has the points lead, which is a bad situation to be in when it seems that from this point on, he will be a little more on the straight and narrow. Obviously, we have no way of knowing for sure. But you've, I mean, look at, look at the results from Detroit on. Um, as you said, since Detroit, it's kind of all been trending Jet. Yeah, no, I mean, it really has. I feel like... Every week, depending on where he starts, he's been able to work his way forward or start up front and pull away. Uh, this week, he did not start up front, but the fact that he worked his way through Eli and Chase the way that he did was incredible. Like it, it, you don't just pass those guys that fast and put a gap on them that fast. Like that is the reigning Supercross champion and one of the greatest of all time in Eli Tomac, and he made those two laps where he passed them and pulled away look like they were not those guys. Like it looked like he was, I, I don't want to pull names, but he looked like he was passing more just, you know, Oh, those guys led for a little bit and now it's the jet show. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to your previous point about uh lap sled, um, jet has whole shot more often than not lately. Um, wing columns looking good more than anyone else. The only statistic that, is kind of uh, indicative of parity is podiums. It's quite surprising that Jet, Chase, and Eli have had the same number of podiums. Um, like, actually, even though I'm as I'm saying it, I'm thinking to myself, how can that be right? Especially Eli, because the narrative has been how terrible Eli has been. But here he is with the same number of podiums as Jet. Um, so maybe that, if you want to believe in the parity, that is a statistic that you can lean on. But aside from that, yeah, it's, it's all jet. And I don't know. I don't know how you beat him. I think first of all, you need to beat him to the first corner, but saying that chase and Eli did that this past weekend. And it was, um, really rendered useless. Yeah. Talking about Tomac, it sounds like after the race, he was livid, which he was pretty kind of, I feel like pissed off after Arlington as well, even though he got second there, got second here again, I don't feel like he is even remotely satisfied with where he's at at the moment, even though it's taken a little bit of time to build back from the injury. Do you think pissed off Eli Tomac is a good thing for maybe things turning around in the second half for him? Like he is going to go ape, you know, wall basically here in a couple weeks. Maybe this is personal opinion, but you say pissed off Eli Tomac. The way that I view that is unsettled. Eli Tomac. Hmm. Um, same, but different, uh, but unsettled sounds a lot more concerning than pissed off. Um, I realize that will probably anger some people. Um, let me ask you this on the same note. Who is Jet's biggest competitor? It's got to come from either Eli, Cooper, or Chase. Um, I know what I'm thinking, but first of all, what would be your stance? Uh, I mean, I would say at the moment it's Eli, but I do think the next handful of rounds, maybe not Seattle, but the next handful of rounds, I think actually favor Cooper Webb a lot more than people are giving him credit for. This is the stretch of the season where in the past when he's been in a title fight, things really start clicking. East Coast dirt can jump the whoops. It breaks down gnarly. He obviously won Arlington, so there's you know, recent memory to show that he has the speed to win. So I would almost say that too many people are counting him out. But that being said, I still would probably put Eli as the main guy that's going to challenge Jet. Okay, see, interesting, because I go for the rider you didn't mention at all. Uh, I've kind of come full circle back to Chase. Um, I believe that around Detroit time, a lot of us presumed it would be Jet versus Chase for the title. I stepped off of that, uh, favoring Eli after he turned it around in Arlington and Cooper um, around the same time. But now, uh, following the events of Daytona, I believe that consistent Chase will 
be Jet's greatest threat. Um, just purely because I see Eli and Cooper being more inconsistent. It's not a comment on speed. It's not a comment on potential. It's purely a comment on consistency. Yeah, no, I mean, that's fair. I think that the problem I have with Chase right now is we discussed that going into Daytona, he needed a top five and then he needed to be on the podium by Birmingham. I think we're actually going to see the opposite. I, I think, depending on how muddy Birmingham is, and it could be a wash, but if we have somewhat of a regular-ish racetrack, I, I would probably put Coop, Eli, and Jet above Chase in terms of total main event speed right now because Chase's start was great in Daytona, but the full race distance is still not there because of the lingering injury. So I, I need to see it be almost back to 100% before I say I would put him above those guys. Yes, agreed. Um, agreed. But I guess I'm not exactly sold on any of them at the moment, beating Jet. Mm. So I'm just kind of trying to predict what is going to happen. And in doing so, I'm kind of factoring in Chase's hand getting better. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I hope it does. And, and for... What it is, I think you're right. I think we're down to these four guys. I think AP, Anderson are out. I think Kenny just keeps not hitting enough that, I mean, he'd have to win like three in a row for him to pull himself back into this at this point. So it's down to four and maybe really it's only down to two or three already after Daytona when coming in, it felt like it was seven. Uh, but let's move on from this topic. Let's go to our second topic here today. And this is... Uh, this is one I was thinking about during the race. And I wasn't there at Daytona, but I've seen enough of these... Supercross features races races to start feeling this way and know enough about what's kind of going on behind the scenes to feel this way a little bit about it. And I'll start by saying this. I think that the futures and the scouting moto combines are great and they are needed for the sport in terms of a transitional aspect from amateurs to pros, especially supercross, which these guys, some amateurs barely ever touch a supercross track before they're forced to go race it with a pro card after they've done like minios and stuff like that. So now to have the opportunity to race supercross futures and get that experience is great for them. The one thing that I keep seeing with futures that stands out to me as a bit of a negative is I think that these kids towers and to a degree drew Adams and, and uh, obviously this Cole Davies kid who is on a six race, it might work. It might not deal with gas gas. I think you, there's almost too much emphasis and pressure being put on them to perform in these very short, not many races uh, of Supercross Futures that we're, you know, like we're almost maybe hurting them because the onus is put on them to, hey, don't go learn Supercross. It's go send yourself for six minutes plus a lap and try to win this race. And if you don't, you might not get a factory contract. But what do you think about that, Lewis? Yeah, I agree. I believe that that is especially prevalent with Towers. Um, we know the reputation of star racing and how they handle their young stars. So I believe that him especially has this uh, sense of urgency and this must execute now mentality. Um, I don't know so much about the others. I feel like I can definitely see that in the way that Towers is riding. Um, but my question to you would be, what do you want to fix it? Like, are, I get the impression that what you want is it to be more of a championship, so less, um, less emphasis is put on the single race and more the end result, which would be rewarding consistency and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I don't know in terms of Supercross exactly what I would like change. I think the Combine works great um because it doesn't seem like those guys are really sending it they're surviving because it's a longer race and so they know and the coaches are there and stuff like that i just think when you think of it like all these other amateur events like the scouting combine for the nfl and i don't know what they do in you know football with england and stuff like that but like even in baseball they have a futures game and it's so not serious but these guys are just trying to showcase their skill sets. And it's like, it's not, if you don't hit a home run in the futures game, you're not going to not get signed to an MLB team. But it seems like the futures kids, if they don't win this race, or the way that their mindset is, at least at it, if they don't win this race, their whole career is screwed because like they feel that they're not going to impress enough people to get on a team or a, a contract or something like that. And like, if you think about the NFL scouting combine, it's not even a game. It's literally just a skill set showcase. It's like who can hit 
this thing the hardest, who can catch the football the best and stuff like that. Um, and so that's what I'm saying is like, we're, we're almost forcing amateurs to like do or die before they're even on a professional level. And that's a little concerning to me. But what I'm getting from you is that actually it's not so much an issue with the format. It's more of an issue with the way that the teams and riders are approaching it. Maybe, but I don't know how you change that about the teams because as you said, the tower situation, he's on the Bennick program this year. Bennick last year was like, hey, you have a star ride, but it's also like trying out for the pro team. And if things go well in Supercross Futures, you'll get a pro ride. That's kind of the same thing. And from what I understand about towers and i've also yeah, 100 percent right and so i've also heard that rider d francesco not winning supercross features not winning the the championship over uh hymas i think got it that year that they both went at it that left some question marks or doubts in the minds of people at pro circuit about what rider d could do and so again we're we're just putting a lot of emphasis on these five six supercross futures races about these kids entire careers and is that right? I don't know. That's what I'm asking, you know? All I can think is that you make it more of a championship. Uh, you don't put so much emphasis on single races. You just make it more of a championship where consistency is rewarded and there's less focus on the here and the now and more on the end result. Um, but then even so, I don't believe that a kid who goes four 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 en route to the championship is necessarily going to be praised. So I do believe it's a mentality issue. How you fix that, I don't know. Um, maybe the governing body needs to get involved with some sort of amateur signing rule or restriction, or I don't know. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe you can't have a futures kid signed without one year of a pro deal. There's no way to police that, but that would at least fix it somewhat. Um it's funny because I'm trying to compare this to EMX 250 in Europe because that is the only real comparison we have. And I cannot really remember an instance where a rider was signed to a deal, struggled in EMX 250, and then wasn't carried into MX2. I feel like even if a rider didn't perform as expected in EMX 250, they were still given that shot in MX2 by the team they were on. Mm-hmm. Um, which is different and i don't know why like i can't pinpoint what the difference is there well so thinking of emx 250 uh one thing that stands out to me is i believe didn't guadagnini and benestant have an emx 250 title fight and benestant won or was that right Ren- yes no? yes there was it was guadagnini and a french kid but i remember if it was benestant or Ren- no, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure it was benestant okay in but- covid years what I remember about that was Guadagnini was so fast and also crashed yep. a lot. Yep. And then I guess it would be Benestant was really fast, but more consistent. Did you feel that watching that, that Guadagnini was like, I got to ride for a ride. Like I am going to go as fast as I possibly can for as long as I can. No, honestly, whenever I've watched the MX250, I've never watched it thinking these kids are trying out for a ride. Who's going to impress the factories? And I don't know why. Again, it's a mentality shift because I watch Futures and I'm like, they're gunning for a ride. Who's going to get it? So why? Why does that even stretch to me? I don't know. Um, I honestly don't know. I have no answers to you for you. Um, could it be that because EMX 250 is taken so seriously in Europe, too seriously in my eyes, just to be clear, that it is, and as I've said in the past, it is MX2 Part 2, so it feels like when they get to EMX 250 and they're on a team, they're set. Like, oh, they're... Like, it doesn't feel very amateur Yeah. Which it doesn't. It doesn't... It feels like a professional series. It does not feel like an amateur event. Mm-hmm. But again, why? Why is that? Because just like Futures, they are embedded into the professional program and racing in amongst the 450 and 250 riders. So the structure is exactly the same. So there is no reason for me to feel that way. So why do I? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's, um, yeah, that is an interesting perspective on it. I guess for me, it's just like, you know, here in the US, Loretta's is taken as like such a huge deal for these amateur kids, even though 
you know, in hindsight, like some of the top pros will say like, oh, Loretta's wasn't everything. Like I had a breakout ride at, you know, Freestone that mattered way more or something like that. Um, but it just feels so much like in Loretta's, those kids just send it for 20 minutes for three motos, but the margins are not as gnarly. Like the 10 commandments are the most super crossy thing they have there. But if you jump off the track on a tabletop there, that's not the end of the world because there's plenty of room. If you jump off the side of the track on a supercross track, you land on tough blocks and slide on the concrete. So like, I feel like that's what I'm saying is that, you know, the, the difference here is these kids are trying so hard to impress at arguably the hardest thing that they're ever going to have to do, which is a full blown gnarly supercross track. And so like, I don't know, I guess I'm saying like, should we do futures when in the track isn't as rough or should we, like you say, do a championship? I don't know what the solution is, but it does seem like something that I keep seeing. Well, what it sounds like is you want futures to go back to how it was before uh, the following no. day. So, but and I agree, I don't think that's the answer. Maybe the answer is like Salt Lake City last year. They are just before opening ceremonies. So mm -hmm. still very much a part of the program, but on a smooth track, not not a rough track mid-program, not really under the spotlight as much. There's less attention just before opening ceremonies. So maybe that is a a fix, but honestly, I believe there is no fix. I just believe it's a mental, a subconscious mentality issue, and I have no idea how to fix that. Yeah. I mean, I think at the end of the day, these kids are always going to go for it. Uh, and if they think their future is on the line, they're going to go for it even harder. So, I mean, it, it's entertaining, I guess, from a fan perspective, because the races have been crazy. The two futures races have been really, really interesting so far. Uh, but I, I think it's just, it puts a lot of pressure on a 16 or 15 year old kid's shoulders to perform. And uh, I mean, maybe that's what it's designed to do. Like I said, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, let's move on to our, our next topic. Uh, we'll go right into a non-moto topic here because we keep putting them right in the middle of the show. I think it works a little bit better. Um, I am so sick, Lewis, of it being cold. I really am. We keep going to these races. It's really cold. Finally, Texas was a little bit warmer. But I've had a cough and sinus problems for like three months now. And I just want it to be warm. I don't like winter weather. I'm not a snow guy. And so I want it to be summer like all season long, but you come from a place where it's a little bit colder. Are you the same as me or do you wish that it was, it was always warm? No, I'm the same as you, but you need to understand that you have it lucky because what's cold by your terms is warm by everyone else's um, or most people's. Uh, for instance, California winter is essentially what a British summer is. Um, and I'm sure I know there's places in America that are much colder than California. So I, f I believe that you maybe need to think about your fellow human and realize that you've got it pretty good. I mean, I know I have it pretty good, but we still, on the schedule at least, go to some pretty cold places. Like it was genuinely cold in San Francisco. I did not go to Detroit this year, thank heavens, but it was freezing there. I've been to that round before. So like... It's just I, I just don't want it to be winter anymore. Like I just want it to be warm again. And I want to the, really it's the stupid cold that just keeps hanging on. Like I'm I'm I keep coughing, keep waking up congested. I just want it to be warm for like a week, burn all that off and then whatever, go back to raining for a little bit, but it's always so cold these days. I don't know. I feel like you're really hung up on this. Like it's it's just for weather. Yeah, but don't like, you this if you could choose the weather, don't you prefer it to be warmer? Yep. Okay. As would I think everyone does. Then let's let's change the the, the debate topic here slightly. <clears throat> Do you wish that it was like midsummer weather, hundreds on a regular basis? I don't know basis? what that means. I don't know what a hundred is. You've never you've never been to a national in a hundred degree heat. No, no, I don't use Fahrenheit, so I don't know what a hundred means. Thirty five. Okay. Yeah, I've done that. And would you prefer that over going to a GP or something where it's borderline snowing because it's that cold? Uh, well, I've been to GPs that are 35 or 100, depending on your preference. Thailand? Um, no, uh, Italy one year was insanely hot. Like, it does get hot in Europe. It's not <laughs> like um, it's not that bad. Um, the coldest race I've ever been to 
was Vulcan Swad 2018 when it was literally snowing and it was below freezing all day. Like the high, well, I don't know Fahrenheit, but the high was like minus two Celsius, yeah. which is whatever. It's like um, 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. I, okay. Well, I don't know if that's good or bad. You got to learn these things, Lewis. You live here now. Yeah, Fahrenheit's a hot. I, I I have wondered for a while how I'm going to get to grips with Fahrenheit, and I don't know how. Um, I don't know how to do that. Um, but yeah, that race sticks out in my mind as the coldest I've ever been because I, it it was one of those races where okay, it was minus two, but it felt like minus twelve. Um, there was snow on the side of the track. It was it was insane. I've never been so cold in my life. It was like you stepped out of the press room. And it was like hitting a wall of ice. Like you just felt it immediately, like attack you. So that's definitely the coldest I've ever been. Was Indonesia, it- uh, Indonesia has never been that hot. To your point, when you said Thailand and stuff, but like, I don't ever remember it being excruciating there. Was the press room at that uh, Valken Sword round like heated? So like you were in there and it was plenty warm enough. Or there was one massive uh, like fan, and obviously that didn't really do much for the whole press room. So everyone just stood around it, huddled all day. Like I, I could not, I could not physically type. Hmm. It yeah. was that cold. My fingers were locked up. Well, that's part uh, of my problem. Is like Anaheim, San Francisco isn't this way. San Diego is, and old San Diego was this way as well. Like these open air stadiums to start the year being as cold as they are. Like, <laughs> dude, it is not fun to work in those conditions. Regardless, I, I, I'm not even talking about the riders and having to deal with the mud and stuff like that. Like, your hands get so frozen. You're just sitting there trying to type, and you just feel like you're you're hit, you're like clanking metal against metal almost because your hands are that cold. Like I just want I, I don't. Can we close these press boxes up, Lewis? Can we get them a little bit warmer at least? You say San Diego. San Diego was behind glass, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Really? Really? I feel like the windows were shut. No, San Diego only has those like rolled down plastic things, but they didn't have them down for the race. Yeah, I've been comfortable. Like Arlington after well, the race. Well, you're from the when, UK. Yes, that's what I mean. You don't realize how good you've got it. Like Arlington <laughs> after the race at 10 p.m., I was doing interviews in a t-shirt, and I distinctly remember you saying to me, I can't believe you're in a t-shirt. Well, because I looked at you and you were like, you're always a little bit, I don't know, anxious. I don't know what the right word is to use, but what, I feel what, like... Whoa, 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 okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're attacking Lewis. What? Let me, let me try to use the right word here. Whenever we are rushing to get stuff done for the scrum or going to a press conference or something like that. I feel like you're fidgety. You're, you're moving fidgety. Sure. That's, that's yeah. a good word. Of yeah. It. I'm fidgety. I'm just, I'm a bit. Fucking and so I turned and mover. saw you and you were arguably the most fidgety I've ever seen you. And it was relatively mm. cold and you were in a t-shirt and I thought, Oh, maybe that's also him being cold, which is why I brought it up. No, I was perfectly happy. Although the next day I did wake up sick with uh, a massive cold. So maybe mm. I did. To be honest, your words rang in my head the next morning of like, maybe Kellen was onto something. Yeah, you should have been in a jacket, sir. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy. Have like, you seen uh, Steve's uh, Alpine Stars jacket? Maybe he could have loaned it to you. I, I, I'm i living the dream. It's 10 degrees and it's like summer in the UK. 10 degrees in summer. Um, well, I just wanted to be... Can we get to outdoors again? I mean, not through Supercross necessarily. I, let's keep going with this great championship fight, but I want to be able to go outside and not freeze. I feel like if I said, this is your topic, I feel like if I was saying what you were saying, I would get so much hate. Oh, I'm going to get hate because no, I'm a California not, kid, so everyone will be like, Kellen. oh, in Michigan today, we shoveled snow for three hours. It was great. I'm like that's no, stupid. That's I, I, awful. You are, you are, you come out smelling of roses. I can just see the hate that I would get if I was saying what you were saying. <laughs> I'll get hate. Don't worry about it. Well, uh, yeah, because I'm trying I'm to turn be the tides a little accounts. bit. I'm trying to turn the tides a little bit and come in with topics that I know will get me hate as well. No, I can do. I I can say, I can say the sun's good, isn't it? And everyone will go, oh no, Lewis hates the moon. Lewis hates the moon. <laughs> Lewis hates the moon. I do genuinely think though that people who actually enjoy like the the problems you have to deal with during winter season are just ludicrous like frozen pipes going out in the morning to start your truck super early to get oil flowing and stuff like that shoveling your driveway and they're like oh it's great we're just having a great time out here in Minnesota and I'm like that looks like no fun like what are you talking about you know well I've never been in that sort of situation so I can't comment but no I don't want to be that cold ever 
You've never had to go out uh, early in the morning before you go to a race and start the car early? Yeah, that, but I've never had to shovel or whatever else. Okay. Well, apparently it doesn't snow enough in the UK. Or in the no, southern it doesn't, UK, snow, in, like it doesn't snow in the south of the UK. I'm too close to... Oh, I was too close to the sea and protected by the downs. The downs? The downs. What does that mean? I could make a joke here. No, um, the downs. The... Um, uh, I don't know how to explain it to you. The countryside? So it's like hills? Or what is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So like, I was... Five minutes from the sea and behind five minutes in the other direction were the downs. Okay. So like big countryside hills. All right. Fair enough. Um, Mix that together and the snow doesn't form. Yeah. Get, get warm again. Bring the sun out. Uh, all right. Halfway through our show here today, we're going to get into our race tech fan topics in a minute. Before we do, big shout out again to EVS Sports. Experience the pinnacle of knee protection and injury prevention with EVS Web Eclipse Knee Braces. For over 39 years, EVS has relentlessly honed their engine engineering expertise, consistently delivering an award-winning knee braces. This legacy of excellence is embedded in every facet of the new Web Eclipse, which represents the culmination of their tireless dedication to innovation and rider safety. Use code LVK30 to save 30% off today. All right. First Race Tech fan question of the week back into some moto topics. Uh, Lewis, did you know that Race Tech gold valves provide a plush feel with drastically improved bottoming resistance and increased traction? Uh, no, I didn't. Tell me more. They, uh, they're made all here in the USA. All race tech products are 100% guaranteed and made here in the USA. Tell me more. More? Okay. Well, did you know that for 40 years, race tech has been supplying the motorcycle industry with high quality suspension components made here in the USA? No, tell me more. No, I'm not going to tell you more. We're going to get into okay. these topics. Um, first topic of the day here from at funky chicken 251 on Twitter uh, asks, do we write off Spain for winning any foreseeable MX of nations events? If Prado goes to Cowie, because there's obviously some rumors floating around that Cian Cerullo will be done at the end of this season before that it even happened. I think we'd all kind of heard the chance that Prado would end up on monster Energy Kawasaki in the USA in 2025. If it happens, Lewis, we know Kawasaki does not like sending their U.S.-based riders to the motocross of nations. Does that mean Prado doesn't go to nations for Spain? I, don't, I hope not. I mean, I feel like the Ice One team in Europe would support whatever Kawasaki rider wants to go. So I don't know what the hang-up is. Um, I hope not, because... For so long, Spain were, irre were irrelevant at the Nations. So the day that Spain wins, and it is coming quite soon, will be such a day of like the underdog did it. Kind of similar to the Netherlands in a way, except even more of a surprise. I know Spain have won it before, but you know, it's, they've been far away from a win for so long. Far away from the podium even. So I'm genuinely excited about the day that Spain wins or Norway podiums, which is also coming. Um... And I really hope that Prado's rumored move to Kawasaki doesn't rob us of that. Yeah, I, I genuinely hope that he's able to go too. Uh, knowing what we do know, though, do you think that, I don't know, Sternstrom, Dan Fahey, these guys at Cowie, would just, it would be a hard no? Or if Prado said, hey, I would like to do it, the, guy, the guys at Ice One can help me, can I go? They would just be like, sure. I don't know because I, I don't know I don't know if anyone's really gotten to the bottom of it enough to really understand. It would be a good story. No one I, don't, I feel like no one's put it into a real in-depth story yet. Um I guess 450 wise, it's not really been put to the test lately because their 450 riders haven't been desperately wanted to go. Um eh, Tomac, I guess Tomac isn't that long ago. So maybe I'm wrong. Am I wrong? Yeah, well, I mean, Tomac was the reason they, they didn't go in 17. Uh, and they instead sent uh, Sealy as the main guy. Yep. Um, so Cowie didn't go that year. They didn't go in 19 to Assen. And that was another year that Cowie and Tomac could have went and probably should have went, but they did not go. They obviously did Redbud, but that was in the USA. So it seems like anything not in the USA, they are a hard no on. Well, it is going to be in the USA next year. So, right. That's so, fixed. I mean, he'll, we won't know then until 2026 if it if it's a possibility. But another thing to think about. Like... <clears throat> another thing I want to ask quickly about that though is, let's say Prado signs a two year deal. 
at the end of 2026, he's in his contract window with Cowie. Does Prado suddenly become a guy that's like, I simply cannot go to motocross of nations in a contract year? Or is he yeah, almost 100%? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like, I almost think that that's another problem that we have to deal with with him coming over here anyway, with regards to motocross of nations is that every single year he might get on a new bike for supercross. Nope. Not going. Uh, Prado, Barres, Fernandez would be such a good team if they can all get there healthy, especially now that they are all on factory bikes. Um, it would be such a good team. It's just one of those teams where the cards have to fall where all of them are healthy and all of them are firing on all cylinders, which, as we've seen with Switzerland, for example, it's hard to get that right. Um, it would be such a good team. Like Put that team up against anyone, I feel, and they would have a fair shot. Uh, do you remember what date the nations at Matterly are this year? October the 2nd? October the 1st? Uh, that probably means Prado wouldn't even go this year. Because normally speaking, yeah. those contracts start October 1, and the SMX rounds are done on the 21st of September this year, so we're not even going into October. He might not even go this year. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if he would be expected to for Gas Gas. He would. I, I mean, I feel like if, especially if he wins the world title again, it would be a lot of pressure to do it, regardless of what bike he's on. I feel like. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Prado's cool enough where I feel like if he he wants to, like he wanted to go back to MXGP to run the number one plate. He wanted to do AMA Supercross for the first couple of rounds. So I feel like he would equally want to race for Spain because I think the vibe that I get is that he is patriotic and like loves doing that stuff. I don't. I don't believe that I've ever heard of Prado shying away from an op not an obligation because that makes it sound wrong from an opportunity. Uh, better way to put it. Do you happen to know if uh, Prado has any, or not even Prado, but just any other Spanish riders don't get along well with Prado? It seems like Guillaume's fine, but like is Ruben uh, cool with him? Is David? No, Rosario's I believe cool that with there him? is no love lost between Prado and Fernandez. Really? So they don't like each other, but they'll. I don't know exactly, for... but I just. But no, that there is no love lost. I only ask because I feel like I'm trying to remember an example of the French team, but I feel like I've remembered the French team was like, oh, this guy's on and he doesn't want that guy. Could that yeah, ever happen? I with can't Spain? remember a specific example, but yes, that has happened. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I hope. I hope Cowie does it. What I was thinking about all this is um, Mitch Payton obviously isn't involved with. Team USA to like a massive level, like he used to be, he used to be like the assistant team manager or something like that alongside Roger. And the PC guys used to go year after year, but it was because they had Wilson and Porcel and Townley and all these Rattray foreigners that were on the program. And what I realized when thinking about that is like, other than Shimoda, who's the last like, like foreign to like somewhat top level guy PCs had? That might even be a root of their problem a little bit. They used to go grab everybody from Europe. And they haven't done that for a while, huh? Uh, yeah. I mean, that was a wild segue. It took. I it had is to really a segue, like, but I'm just. I, I was thinking about it. That. So. Um, I was trying to figure out how that ties into the nations, but no, yeah, you are correct. Um, but truly, when was the last time anyone did that? What left left Europe and came over? Well, no, like any time. Like, think, name me a, apart from Star. I guess name me a team that's pulling talent from Europe. Honda. Uh, uh, Lawrence okay, Brothers. That, happened, that was 2017. That was a while ago. I mean, okay. I'm talking like in the last five years. Last five years? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I can't... Vial? KTM? Yeah, true, but that's not... I, I guess... I guess for Ferris, it to count in my, Star? Yeah, that's why I said Star is the only example, but Vial doesn't count in my mind because that's the same team. I mean, for... Uh, KTM to go and sign a Honda rider from Europe because they look great, or Kawasaki to go and sign a Yamaha rider from Europe because they see the talent there. It's more of sharing talent when it's same team, well, different you know pond. Our lovable friends at Bar X when grabbed Anthony Bourdon. <laughs> that only proves our point, doesn't yeah. disprove it. Yeah, well, you seem to think a lot of guys are coming. Maybe, maybe they'll stay. Yeah, Kunin's are coming in twenty twenty. I always mess up. Kunin's are coming 2026, for sure. Kaida Wolf wants to come, but doesn't have an established path yet. 
Beniston wants to come, but same. I believe he has a clause in his Yamaha contract where he can come if he does X well. Um, I believe that's uh, I believe that's it. Short term of riders, Prado, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I believe that's it as far as like immediate talent. Well, Mitch Payton, time to dial up one eight hundred Kai DeWolf. Give him a give him a path. Yeah, I mean, well, again, why not? I feel like, uh, yeah, to your point, I feel like Mitch would have done that 15 years ago. Yeah, and it worked a lot of times pulling that that type of guy. Yeah, it's uh, true. Back over here. Um, yeah, so kind of let's let's roll along with our GP topics here because we were talking about nations and now we're getting into GPs and the GP season is starting this weekend in Argentina, uh, first round of the season and. I think the way we want to kind of phrase our MXGP preview of the season a little bit is not so who do we think is going to win the title or anything like that, but Argentina is the first round. It's a flyaway round. And the same way that we look at Anaheim one is like, Oh, you can't read results from Anaheim one. It could be anything, even though jet has obviously continued to lead the points here. But what do we think about Argentina? Like going into this, are you going to watch that round and think like, Oh, okay. So like guys are just one straight up. If he goes one, one, are we like, damn or is it like eh, that could be totally different by round two no i'm all in because everyone's healthy and everyone has had these preseason races so technically it's not the first race and blowing off cobwebs they've all raced a lot um will i be super concerned about what it means for the end championship no because injuries just seem to destroy mxgp every year but i will be putting stock into it as oh X rider is the best guy. Um, it will actually be quite interesting because Argentina is a fairly even playing field. It's sandy, but it's not sand. So anyone can win there. And then Spain, the second round, is hard pack, jumpy uh, car park track. So anyone can win there. The third round, Sardinia, you obviously take hurlings to win that. Um, but the first two rounds will create quite an interesting dynamic, I do believe. Geyser has always been the best at Argentina. I shouldn't say always been the best. Guys that has the best track record at Argentina. So that's good for him. Uh, Spain is, uh, yeah, it's anyone's game. Um, it really is anyone's game in my eyes. So it should be a very interesting start to the year. I'm excited. In the past, uh, when you were covering GPs and we'd start with a flyaway because we would, it started with Qatar for a while and now it's Argentina. And wasn't there, I think there was a time where the first two or three GPs were flyaways, but I can't. Uh, 2016, the first four were flyaways. Right. It started with Qatar, Thailand, Argentina, Mexico. Yeah. Is a sentiment back then and even into today that you can't, like the championship kind of doesn't really start till you get back to Europe in any sense, or do, do, does that not matter either? Yeah. But, well, yeah, there is that sort of vibe, but honestly, MXGP has been so downtrodden with injuries for so long that the vibe isn't exactly that. The vibe is let's just get to round 12 and okay. see what's happening. Um, it's crazy to me. I think we discussed it last week. It's crazy to me that Supercross is meant to be this really dangerous sport, but yet it's MXGP every year that is just destroyed by injuries. And I don't know why. I don't know what the reason for that is. Um, so yeah, I had a team manager who I was talking to off record last week, who and I was like getting excited, like your rider, your rider A looks great, your rider B looks great, your rider C looks great. And I went, honestly, I don't care. Like, I just want to get to round 12. And if they're healthy, we'll go for it. But we've seen enough times that the first 10 rounds really mean nothing if you're not going to make it to round 12. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would think that why it stands out probably is because what it's 40 motos. Sometimes it's been even more than 40 motos of racing and well, any what add in qualifying races. It's 60 motos. Exactly. So now we're at 60 motos a year of to some degree, high intensity gate drop racing. At some point, something's got to break. Like you get to 37 motos in, you're, you're going to have guys having big ones. I don't know. I feel like that's probably more of the problem. Honestly, Kellen, I'm excited. Like, uh, Hurlings, Sewer, Geyser, and Prado have all won preseason races. So they are all believing they are the guy because they've all won already. Yeah. Uh, and Fevra has not won an overall, but he's won motos at different events. So he too can be quite good, like, feel good about himself. Um, they're all healthy and they all feel good about themselves. 
Like, so it is how like good A1. is that? Like, it's, it's really like A1. <laughs> Everyone yeah, feels except, great. Our bikes are all great. <laughs> I mean, okay, I shit on the preseason races, but in some ways this is better than A1 because there are no cobwebs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, everyone... Yeah, like, like there's no, there's no, there's no like, oh yeah, you know, I'm just easing into it. It's like, well, you raced four times already. What yeah. are you doing? Um, like, uh, Max Anstey always says that round one of whatever Supercross series he's doing is his Hawkstone Park because, <laughs> okay. because that does matter. Like that warm up race does matter to making sure you get better. Um, I do believe that everyone will be out to make a statement this weekend. Hurlings will want to remind everyone how good he is. Geyser will want to set the tone and like kind of eliminate his bad 2023. Uh, Prado will want to prove that he owns the number one plate for a reason. Um, Fevre just generally is always out to prove a point, it seems. Like, it's going to be great. I honestly cannot wait. Um, I'm getting like goosebumps as I talk about it. It's going to be great. It's... I don't know how long it's going to be great for because everyone will be injured by round four. <laughs> so for now, I'm excited. Uh, so in seeing the preseason races and how they've gone and knowing, I guess, what Jeffrey has said about himself and how he kind of views himself going into the season, do you have a clear favorite that you think is going to win this weekend? Or is it still too up in the air? I do a I do an MXGP podcast with Adam Wheeler on uh, Vital MX and we both agreed that geyser is the smart pick with your head uh decision um he's the old reliable pair of hands which is crazy to say about the guy who cartwheels maybe more but than he's anyone gumpy, else so he's not gonna yes. get hurt um but yeah he is and as bad as it sounds he's almost a boring pick because i feel like if geyser wins the title it will be like yeah the safe, reliable pair of hands got it done, you know? <laughs> Whereas anyone else, it'll be kind of an interesting, massive story. Uh, Hurlings, Hurlings is always a story. Prado um, backing up his title and then leaving. Uh, Fevre getting it done nine years after his first title. Jesus. Uh, Sewer, the first time ever. Um, you know? Whereas Geyser, it'll just be like, of course, we all should have known that Geyser <laughs> would just truck along to the title. Um, so Geyser is for smart head pick. If you want to put money down, it's Geyser. My gut is Hurlings is for best rider as long as he stays healthy. My gut is Prado's going to be out to prove a point. Um, so yeah. Okay. It's, it's a fascinating dynamic. And you know what? Part of the reason I'm so excited is because Pardo's going to America. Hurlings will retire at the end of 2025. Fevre will probably retire at the end of 2025 as well. Geyser doesn't have that long left. I'm excited because this may be our last shot Okay, to See, have these guys together. You just said five different names in Prado, Hurlings, Fevre, Geyser, Seawer. I think yep. those are the ones you all mentioned. Last year, none of those guys won the opener because Ruben Fernandez did, even though Prado left with... I think we were, Didn't he leave with the red plate because he won the qualifying race? And then, yeah. yeah so there's Third a whole... step of the podium, but got the red plate. It was right. very weird. Fantastic. Lovely. Um, do you see a dark horse? And it could even be Ruben again, but a guy like that, that going into this weekend is like, wait a minute, he could win the opening round and still you know, be in the mix here. To win the opening round, I mean, Renault is probably the safe bet. Um, well, not safe bet, but, you know, he's just as good as the other guys, but he hasn't had such... He hasn't had quite as much success, and therefore he's not viewed the same. Um, I fully admit I don't view him as a title contender, but he could very well be one. So that would be the guy. Um, Gertz, maybe? I mean, he was great at Redbud on a 450. Redbud, when it was wet, maybe not too different to Argentina. Yeah. Um, Lomi dirt, soft. Yeah, you can see the similarities. Yeah. So maybe got maybe Gertz um to win round one. Yeah, you are, not, the, not the title. We're talking yeah. about the opening round. No, so. and and also like there are a lot of dark horses, but would I consider any of those dark horses a pick to win Argentina? No. Hmm. Um, okay. It's just crazy to me. It's just it's gonna be great. It's yeah. gonna be great. It'll, it'll be great. And and then we'll be back next week to talk about all the crashes that we witnessed i'm sure everyone will be injured after round one um <laughs> yeah. and and heaven horgmo will be en route to the championship okay yeah um uh is that gifting 
or win, yes. win their opening round or something like that. Uh, something super off the wall. <coughs> um, okay. Let's get into our final topic, non-moto topic for uh, the last one to wrap us up here today. Second race tech fan question of the week because we wanted to pull two off of Twitter since we uh, haven't been too on top of that. But this one's a pretty good one and I feel like it, it ties into uh, now that you live here full time and how this is working for you so far in living here full time. Ranty80 on Twitter says, Lewis, what's one thing you miss about the UK and one thing you prefer about the US? Well, let me tell you what I 100% miss about the UK. There are two items. One, a Nando's. Boy, do I want a Nando's. Oh, my days. I would kill for a Nando's. Oh, have you ever had a Nando's? I have had a Nando's, yeah. Where have you had a Nando's? In London. Oh, yeah, you have been to the UK. Yeah, so I just, I, I, I was trying to um, remember if you've been to the UK and I automatically was trying to picture you at a race. I forget. Good, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, did you get the chicken thighs? I uh, think so. Oh, I honestly chicken don't remember. Thighs. So. It wasn't oh. a super memorable experience for me. I apologize. Okay. And then also, number two, a Greg sausage roll. Oh, what is that? You, yeah, you don't do sausage rolls in America. It's yeah, but very what, disappointing. what even is that? It's like a sausage in pastry. Pastry, is it? Pastry? Warmed up. Oh. Sounds like a pig's in a blanket, but sausage? No. No, because pig's in a blanket is uh, bacon, isn't it? No, it's uh, like a hot dog. Okay, in England, a pig in a blanket is a sausage wrapped in bacon. Interesting. Okay. No, here it's uh, a hot dog wrapped in like a, uh, a croissant. Well, that's stupid. And so is your... Yeah, it's all stupid. <laughs> Everything you just said is stupid. Um, uh, <laughs> if you are British and listening to this, please tweet Helen and A, tell him how good the Nando's are, the chicken thighs from Nando's are, and also how good a Greg sausage roll is. It's like... what? It's just... Oh, uh, British staples. And you, you know what? <clears throat> you said pigs in a blanket there is a sausage wrapped in bacon? Is that what you said? Yeah. That's pigs wrapped in pigs. It's not wrapped don't in a blanket. Don't ask me. I don't. Uh, I didn't. What are you guys doing it? over there? Pigs. It's a pig in a blanket. Okay. It's a pig um, in a pig blanket. So, a Nando's and um, what's what's it called? A sausage roll. Yeah. And you just do you have it with any like sauce or is it just a roll? Well, you can dip it in ketchup. If, no, but no, you don't really. No. Okay. All right. Honestly, uh, honestly, you. I guess you'll go to the nations this year. Yeah. Well, you'll land in Heathrow, and we'll go to Cobham Services. And we'll get a Greg sausage roll. And you know what? There's a Nando's at Cobham Services as well. So we'll just do both. We'll do an LVK taste test pod. Oh, honestly, if you are British, please tweet Helen and confirm what I'm saying. Because, <laughs> And you know what? Normally, I do not believe that anyone agrees with me. But those two items are British staples. Okay. So it's food related so far. Is there anything in the US that, yeah, you, good point. that you prefer in the US over the UK then? Uh, okay. Well, I'll say Chipotle to keep it food related. Um Wait, uh, uh, um, yeah, prefer in the US. Mm -hmm. It's just being in America. I just like being in America. I don't know why. It just feels a bit better. You like driving me. on the right side of the road better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm left-handed, so I think that kind of works. Does local transportation bother you? No, because I don't do that anywhere. Do you Like in London or in Europe, you don't like use local transportation ever? No, in London, I'll use the tube if I have to, but I'll, like, That's I'll drive. That's local transportation. Yeah, but if I have to, like... If I'm going somewhere in London and like I'm not going to drive into the middle of London because that's just a nightmare. Um, but like, yeah, I don't get on a bus for the sake of it. Okay, I'm trying to think of, of things that are common here that you would maybe not have there or would miss. Honestly, it's not that different. Like you, like you would be led to believe it's a different world, but it's not. Um, it's very similar. Just. Is completely different is it weird for you at all to not have british people just all around you constantly oh uh, i do miss uh, we'll get we've said it before i'm struggling hard with the sarcasm issue oh yeah well and the we've been over british this several humor. times now yeah yeah it's still a problem i was literally telling someone last night how i don't know what to do because i cannot actually someone stopped me in daytona and said lewis 
I love your sarcasm, and it make you make me laugh so much, but no one here will understand it. And I was like, I know. And it was a British dude? No. Uh, <laughs> so it was an American guy that understood no, it. No, was, it I can't tell you who it was. It was someone in the industry. Oh, okay. So I don't know if they want to be named. All right. Um, but yeah, I was like, yeah, I know. I need. To, I was like, I need to change my personality, but it's hard because, like, like, yeah, it's hard because that is my personality. Um, yeah. But I, don't worry, I'm becoming less sarcastic. I think. I think. I, I believe if you track it, there is a marked difference between Lewis on episode one of this podcast and Lewis on episode eight. Yeah, you're you're much more literal, Lewis, as you yep, put it. Because I'm sick of it. Because, <laughs> for instance, press day. Detroit, and we've laughed about this time and time again. I said to Max in an interview on press day in Detroit, oh, blah, 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 so much talk about you flying at the test track. It must be weird for you to have this much attention. This time last year, no one even knew your name. Obviously joking. Obviously. I got blew up by like five to six different people calling me an absolute dickhead and how <laughs> dare you say to say that no one knows Max Anstey's name. We all knew who Max Anstey was. How dare you? He had him. And it's like, and then I literally replied to someone and said, I was obviously joking. And they, they doubled down. Of course you'd say that now you've been called out. You're just trying to get yourself out of a corner. We know what you did. And it's like, mate, oh my God. Like, and that's not even hardcore sarcasm. That's just quite obviously a joke. Oh my God. Like, honestly, I just want to bury my head in the sand and light myself on fire. Because what, which also might be counterproductive, because I'd imagine the sand would put out the fire. So actually, that may not work. But, oh my God. Like, if I could, like, that, so obviously a joke. When that bit me in the ass, I genuinely was like, I can't say anything. I can, I have to I have to be middle of the road. I cannot say anything because how obviously how obvious is that that that's a joke? And especially when one British guy is saying that to another British guy, you'd be like, hang on, Lewis. They're both British. There's a high chance that Lewis probably knows that people knew Max Anstey's name. <laughs> it's all it's all right there in front of you. It's all right there. You've just got to connect the pieces of the puzzle. You don't the puzzle pieces are laid out in front of you. You don't have to do much else. Just got to connect them. So, but no, so too what, hard for people. What we've decided is you miss sausage rolls, I just miss not being Nando's, attacked, Kevin. and sarcasm. I, no, I just miss not being attacked. The good old days when I could not be attacked. The good old days when I didn't have to watch my back everywhere. Didn't have well, to double. Didn't have to really like consider what I'm saying. Didn't have to be like, oh, well, maybe that's not gonna. Maybe that'll get taken the wrong way. I could just speak my mind. Yep. I think we all miss those days, but well, you, you came from a different uh, you came from a different type of paddock over there. Than, just to be than clear, just to be clear, yes, we all knew Max Anstey's name before last year. <laughs> like, fuck, like is that what we're, that what I've got to do now? Probably, yeah. But then Brilliant. on the flip side, if we do that and if we dumb everything down super easy so people know that we know things. And we go right back to a topic we had on like episode three or something here, which is why doesn't the media ever get personality out of these writers or why does the media never ask the hard questions or anything like that? Yeah, like like that made that made Max laugh in the interviews. We loosened up mm -hmm. because that he was like, ha, ha, you know, like and then I, and someone even said like you could tell he was uncomfortable. So like, oh my god. Oh, but and I wouldn't overreact to this if it was one person. It was like six. Would you like to they tell? They all just formed a little group. Would you like to tell those people who are upset at you about making Max uncomfortable whose uh, house you're sitting in at the moment, or no? Do we not want to go there? Uh, I don't care. Yeah, I'm staying at Max's house this yeah, week see, because so he lives in. Go. He's obviously not lives, uncomfortable with Lewis. He lives in Tallahassee, which is between Daytona and Alabama. So I just thought to myself, like, why would I go all the way back to California? Um, don't worry though, I have him wearing a name tag every day just in case I forget. Yeah, you've. <laughs> You forgot Max Anstey. Because I only tag. I only learned his name last year, so you know there's a chance. <laughs> oh. It's recent. I only learned it recently, so it could enter. It could leave my head just as easy easily as it entered. See, that's why we wish that you could have your sarcasm back, because that's quality right there. That's quality joke, Lewis. Just like it's just sad. It is sad. Like 
I did the MXGP podcast show with Adam Wheeler on Vital MX last week. And Sua said, Oh, I hope Lewis is I hope I'm Lewis's favourite for the championship. And I went, Nope. There's a guy called Ben Watson, and he's gonna make you wish that you signed for beta instead of Kawasaki. And as I was saying it, I was just like, people are gonna take this seriously. Oh yeah, they will. But and like he you, loved it. He was like, ha ha. Did you ha, get hate mail? Ha. No, That's, not on that. No? Really? Okay. It's so mainly YouTube. The people. Europeans understand. It's the yeah, the Europeans understand. It's the Americans so the, that we have a problem with. But I don't know if it's the Americans. It's just the Americans on YouTube. <laughs> well, YouTube is just like a cesspool of yeah stupidity. Honestly, well, having no, a I, YouTube like channel as long as YouTube I have, comments, I know that. So I like to believe that YouTube comments can. Um, by the way, just to clarify, it was Kellen who just said that the comments are a cesspool of idiots. So I, I'll stand by that. Okay, just if you are now commenting, it's Kellen. You need to make that complaint out to. I think that everyone in the comments is amazing and intelligent. And you know what? Probably writing a novel about Pythagoras' theorem at the moment. So it's Kellen who doubts everyone in the YouTube comments. If it makes those people feel any better, I am also that cesspool of idiots in comments on other videos. So I basically call myself out there. But you, well, Just honestly, honestly, just gives me, give me a Nando's and give me less grief, and I'll be happy. Give me Nando's and give me less grief. I think uh, you need to put that as a bumper sticker on your car. Maybe that can be my Instagram bio for this week. <laughs> your bio for this week. Oh, like, it, like, it's just insanity. Like, as I've said a million times, the way that I managed to get on such good terms with the GP riders is because we just hurl insults at each other. Yep. Huh? Just fuck. And it just made it great. Well, you Not know, working here. You know, what strategy needed. You know, what's funny about that in the U.S. That's what, like, if you're at a moto event, that's what, like, literally everyone does. If you're close friends and like all nine of you are hanging out at a camp or something like that, and the second it turns into not your group of people, that's when it gets all personal. But that's totally oh, I, how it is. When they gave me my visa, they should have given me a rule book. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's called um, the Declaration of Independence. Have you read it, sir? I will do, and that will help me understand. <laughs> I did actually clarify with Max in the Arlington press day interview. I said, just to be clear, we did all know your name before last year. I just want to make that abundantly clear here on the record. So don't worry, I'm really paving. I'm learning from my errors. And let me guess, he laughed at that too? He just laughs at everything. I think yeah. I'm a joke to him. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's another topic for another day. Yeah, he said um, he said, I hope you come and stay at my house between Daytona and Alabama because it'll be funny. So I'm yeah. literally just here for jokes. Have the bancers bands been good? No, because I'm really trying to get him back on the right track. Two six eight. It's mm. I've been honestly, Kellen, I've been up at the crack of dawn. Um cracking the whip driving behind him as he's jogging in the rain, eating uh, yelling at him to go fast like a spin a lot. Eating but, uh, you know. checkers or whatever the, the good restaurant is down there. He overheard Waffle me doing House. a podcast. He overheard me doing a podcast the other day where I didn't pick him as the favorite for the championship, and then immediately was like, "Didn't want to pick the guys who the guy whose house you're staying at." And I was like, "No, <laughs> kick <laughs> you out right now." He'll, he'll he'll do what you did at Dark Side. Just put you on the but, curb. But, but this is the point. When you're that comfortable with someone, you don't like, I don't like, I think people think like, oh, you're staying at Anstey's house, your favorite. And I'm like, no, I actually feel more comfortable with telling him if he does something shit. Hmm. Yeah. No, like, I mean, like, you can be more honest with the people who you're closer to. So. Yeah. It's like, um, yeah, like, I, uh, yeah, I don't know. I feel, I feel like that's also misconstrued sometimes. But anyway, give me a Nando's and less grief and we'll be happy. Nando's and left, less grief. That's the name of the podcast this week. All right. That is it for the EVS Sports LVK More Than Moto podcast episode number eight. Shout out EVS Sports Nomura and Race Tech for backing the show. Thanks so much for joining me. And we'll be back after Alabama with more talk, more moto, and more non-moto here on the LVK podcast. <laughs>